Uh, it's been a little, it's been a while since I've given one of these talks, but I'm Christy Boyd. I am a pediatric uh, sports medicine, um, non-operative uh, faculty member here at Stanford. Um, I've been here for, gosh, I think seven years, but I've been doing this for about 20. There we go. Here we go. All right. Can we see all that now? We good? We are good. All right, so okay. sports injuries obviously cause musculoskeletal pain. There's two main types of injuries. One is acute, one is chronic. And the reason I go over this is because the different modalities used at home are beneficial for different things. Um, I would say our in our office, it's probably 50-50. Um, ankle sprains, you know, acute injuries, uh, fractures, a lot of non-operative fractures I see in the office. Um, and then the chronic stuff, the two years of knee pain, you know, one year shoulder pain, things of that nature. There's a lot of uh, over-the-counter options to treat sports injuries um, with a variety of claims. Um, and they range from you know, pain relief to healing faster to making you, you know, improving your performance or even in some regards, preventing injury. Um, so today I wanna go over the kind of the efficacy and the safety of these items. Um, so that you are able to provide some appropriate advice to patients um, with, you know, and know the limitations of our evidence behind a lot of this advice. Um, again, most of the evidence uh, that we have is anecdotal. It's not evidence-based. The studies are not great. You're gonna hear me say that multiple times over the course of the next 45 minutes. Um, but I think we need to dive into what we do know so that we can um, decide which of these things do we need to spend some more time investigating and which of these things um, are likely just not, not valuable. Um, all right. I picked ones that are common in our clinic. Um, it just kind of, the list just kept expanding and expanding. So at some point in time, I just had to make it to stop. So I'm not covering everything. I'm just covering the ones that we tend to get asked about the most, you know, the visits ending. Um, they say, well, what about this? Or what, I have this at home. Can I use this? That's the kind of stuff we're looking to talk, cover today. So today's agenda, these are the items that were, that made the top 10 or top eight. Um, the massage gun, kinesio tape or KT tape. TENS unit, um, laser, ice bath, whole body cryotherapy, these, cha these chambers. And then we're gonna cover some of the creams, ointments, soaks, patches, et cetera, that people will use at home. So after I cover each section, I'm gonna just uh, I'll answer a couple of questions in the Q&A as they come up if need be. Um, all right, the things we're not gonna cover today are orthobiologics, so PRP, prolotherapy, I won't answer any Q&A on that. That's a whole different talk. Talk, talk, oral supplements, um, and then also supplements that are used, uh, protein powders, creatine, et cetera. I'm not gonna go into that today, that's a different talk. All right, so let's start number one, massage guns. Um, so these are handheld mechanical devices. They uh, are, it's percussive therapy, so it's burst of pressure um, to the myofascial tissues. I don't know how many of you guys have actually felt them at home, and they range from a really mild pressure to a really intense pressure. There's a lot of different shapes of the applicator tips. Um, a lot of them come where you can switch them out. Um, there are different stroke depths or amplitude. Um, some, you know, the more expensive ones have multiple options. The less expensive ones just have one option. It is self-controlled. You can, um, you determine how much pressure you put on the device towards the skin. In 2016, TheraBody re reduced introduced the Theragun. It was the first mass market gun. So a lot of people will talk about a Theragun uh, rather than a massage gun. Um, it's, a, it's a brand name. Um, and it was the first mass marketed um, one that was semi-portable and semi-affordable. So the proposed benefits of the massage gun are that it promotes blood flow. It reduces myofascial restriction. It improves range of motion. It alleviates pain and it can decrease delayed onset muscle soreness. You'll talk, to, I'll bring this, I'll use this term later as well. Um, this is that soreness you get in a day or two after a hard workout. Um, and for uh, for many athletes, it's important to decrease that. I mean, if for me, you know, if I work out hard on a Sunday and I'm sore for two days, it's not a big deal because I'm just going to work on Monday or Tuesday. But for an athlete who's training or has multiple games on a weekend, being sore two days later um, is definitely not ideal. They want to get back into their training. And so um, decreasing that can be beneficial. So um, the evidence. So again, these are at the very end of my talk, I have two full slides of size 10 font listing of all of the 
uh, articles I dug through. Uh, there's a lot of them. Some of them are good quality, some are not. Um, but uh, they're, uh, I'm going to tackle the ones that I thought were most useful in, um, in this talk. Um, so th this, uh, Ferrer looked at, recently looked at 281 different topic, different studies, and only 11 could be included. Um, and what, what the conclusion was is that, that there may be some help uh, in short-term improvement of range of motion, flexibility, and recovery. Um, again, this is short-term. It's not recommended for improving strength, balance, balance, agility, and explosive activity. So for example, if you're heading into a game using the massage gun, hoping that it's gonna make you jump higher, run faster, probably not gonna work. Um, another Theragun specific study. So they just look at just the Theragun device that it was able to improve hamstring flexibility. Um, two 60 second sessions with a 30 second rest in between. For some of our growing kids, this probably has some relevant value. Um, we, we oftentimes tell them to use a foam roller. Um, so if they have a Theragun at home, it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. Um, and sometimes it's a little bit more uh, novel than a, than a foam roller. Um, some earlier studies have also shown that it does decrease some of the, the um, delayed onset muscle soreness. So if somebody had a hard, hard event on a Saturday and had to come back and run in a second event on Sunday or play in another game, uh, there could be some value to it. Um, there's no agreement on how to develop these. <clears throat> there's all sorts of sizes, settings, amplitators. So when you're trying to do a study to figure out what works and what doesn't work, it's very, very mixed. Um, most evidence is anecdotal. Um, so then again, switching over to safety, because ultimately as when we're giving advice to families, we can't guarantee something's gonna work, but we probably should make sure that it's not gonna hurt them. Um, there's very few reports of injuries. Um, this is one that I'm showing you because this is not a good way to use the massage gun. Um, there have been some um, theoretical concerns um, of uh, strokes, um, or if you're doing a uh, massage gun up uh, on the neck that you can hit some of your vital uh, vasculature, um, somebody with osteoporosis um, potentially could cause fractures. Um, so that's not a, a good idea. Again, not really our patient population. Um, bleeding, so if you have a hematoma, so if somebody has a quad contusion or they have a muscle tear and they've developed a hematoma in that area, using a massage gun on there is a really bad idea. That's just gonna increase the bleeding. If you're looking at something that's subacute, that's two weeks old, that's some scar tissue, that's very different, um, but staying away from anything acute or any bleeding. And then if somebody has a history of an inflammatory condition, like a fibromyalgia type picture, um, the, the microtrauma to the muscle might not be the best idea and potentially could cause a flare. Uh, there have been reported cases of really mild rhabdo um, from somebody going over the top and over the board. And that's also, I think, one thing I'm going to bring up right now and that I will, um, you'll hear me say it again later on. Um, you know, there's always that case of somebody who takes this device to an extreme and uses it beyond what's recommended um, and it can cause damage. So that would be a rhabdo. So my thoughts, you know, I think there is a potential for range of motion and flexibility. It is a per, you know, portable method for self-massage. Um, it does do a better job of targeting individual muscles as opposed to a foam roller. They can be expensive. Um, if you use them improperly, you can cause risk, but there are, again, lack of any real good studies to, um, to back up their claims. And then no, you know, the, the basic rule of thumb, you know, no one muscle group for more than two minutes, ideally 30, 20 to 30 seconds per group, you know, avoid the neck, spine, right on the bones and joints um, and avoid acute injuries and contusions. So hold on one sec. All right, so my Q and A, is it gonna be recorded? Yes, it is being recorded. Um, and max duration recommended. Um, yeah, if somebody, what's the max duration? Again, that's just that I would, probably wouldn't do go more than two minutes in one. Having somebody else use the massage gun on you, I think that's a little bit uh, challenging because it really, you know, that that's the potential of somebody. Um, uh, not, I would say that's not recommended um, unless it's like your posterior aspect, but just being really careful on that on that front. All right, let's go on to the next slide. Now I've lost my, there we go. KT tape. Okay, next topic. Taping has been used for years and years. Um, in the 70s, 
Kinesio tape was invented by um, this guy, uh, Dr. Kenzo Case. The goal, initial goal of his research was to improve the body and joint position with tape that was flexible enough to preserve range of motion, but lightweight enough to stay on the skin without causing a rash. Uh, he was attempting to mimic the elasticity of um, uh, human, human skin. Um, kinesio is, you know, is the study of movement, and so that's where that term came from, and KT tape was his original brand. So that's the, the term you'll hear a lot, um, but again, it's a brand name. It was donated to 58 countries for the 2008 Olympics, and then in the 2012 Olympics, it exploded in popularity as it became colorful. So now you see it all over the place. Um, lots of brands, KT tape, rock tape, spider tape, you know, and it's gotten all the way down into, you know, Rite Aid sells a brand. Um, so there, again, there's a lot of different variations that have evolved over the past 10 years. All right. Um, so proposed benefits, um, one is that it would, it potentially could correct dysfunctional biomechanics. Um, it could potentially uh, enhance your performance. It could relieve pain. The evidence on biomechanics, there's conflicting studies. The majority say no effect, that it doesn't really affect your biomechanics. There's no evidence that it helps with performance enhancement. Pain relief, um, there was a, a really nice, uh, well, not a detailed um, study in 2019 where they used basically an MR um, type study looking at what the KT tape did to the muscle stiff, stiffness, and it does have an effect on the superficial depth of the muscles. Um, again, this was a one that I thought was interesting more recently. Um, it was a, a, a decent study looking at um, plica, and again, we see a lot of medial patellofemoral pain in young uh, athletes, um, and it showed that KT tape plus PT um, was more beneficial than KT tape alone. I mean, sorry, than PT alone. And so there's a potential additive effect um, that may be beneficial. Um, and then lastly, um, another, another nice uh, um, review shows some immediate short-term positive effect on reducing pain for low back pain, um, but no improvement in function or range of motion. Again, this is short-term. All right, so again, KT tape is all over the place, used in all sorts of, uh, applications. And then of course, with that comes lawsuits. So in 2015, KT tape had to pay uh, a large sum to resolve allegations of false advertisement, um, saying that it could prevent injuries and provide pain relief. Rock tape had a similar uh, allegate class action suit in 2019. Um, these lawsuits aren't really about that they're that it's not safe. It's more that the claims that they're making are not have not been um, proven. Uh, safety of it, skin rashes is probably the biggest thing. Um, thoughts. It's fairly cheap. Um, you know, I always uh, kind of get a good kick out of these kids coming in with tape all over the place. Um, so I think there's and there's a zillion uh, YouTube videos on how to apply different types of tape. Um, I think it's very safe. I don't think it's going to hurt anything. Um, there's a very strong placebo effect. I think tape does have a sensation tweaking effect. Um, but there's some benefits in some recent research. I think it does deserve some continued study. Um, again, that's just my opinion. I'm not doing the study, but I do think there is some potential value to it. And so if somebody finds it helpful, I encourage them to continue with it. Um, if somebody asks, you know, is it helping? If, if it doesn't help, do I need to keep doing it? Then no, I would not have them keep doing it. All right, let me just take a peek. Um, hey, Sam, I know you're, you're still on. I don't know how to get rid of these questions in my Q and A. Um, so I must, I'm probably messing that up. I'll, I'll take care of it. I'll dismiss the ones that you've answered already. Awesome. Um, uh, the question is, did I see anything on lymphatic drainage? Um, I did see stuff. I did not dive into it very much because I was really looking at more of the MSK. Um, as far as swelling after acute injuries and that sort of stuff, I did not see much. Um, but as far as in you know somebody with a chronic um, lymphatic issue, uh, there were studies that, that I did not get into. All right, next. TENS units. So this is probably one of the things I'm, I don't have as much experience with because we don't see it very often. I usually, when this comes up, it's usually somebody has a unit at home that a, a parent was using for some pain issue and they ask me, is it safe or will it help? Um, and so that's kind of the approach I'm taking when I'm talking about TENS units here today. 
Um, again, this is nerve stimulation. They're usually available in small portable units. They attach to the skin by adhesive pads. They're um, a lot of times they're mobile devices that can be worn during, you know, during activity and with motion. Um, there's small electrical impulses. Um, you can control things like the intensity, frequency, and duration. There's a high frequency version and a low frequency version. It's used a lot in pain clinics for chronic pain, uh, more on the adult side. Um, the, the proposed mechanism is that the electrical impulses flood the nervous system and they decrease the nervous system's ability to transmit pain signals. Um, there's also some thought that they stimulate endorphins, which help with pain control. It is a non-invasive way. It's a pain relief, it, a pain relief modality. It's not looking to heal anything faster. Um, so there's really a lot lack of strong clinical evidence. Um, there's a lot of studies that show a positive impact with pain control and chronic pain syndromes, not really with sports injuries. Uh, when there is benefit, it's usually short term. Um, usually the, the, the studies that showed the most benefit is when the unit was being worn while the person was being active and moving around as opposed to like when they're sleeping or sitting still after school. Uh, there is a development of tolerance to a TENS unit. So if you use it a lot, it stops working as well. And I just wanted to mention this because a lot of our patients are in physical therapy. And for those of us, I know I have some physical therapists on this call. You're going to think this is really silly that we would even think it's the same thing. Um, but for those of us who are not really familiar with a lot of the uh, electronic stuff, um, it's different than the EMS or electronic uh, electric muscle stimulation that you see PT clinics use. Those are the, where they put the, you know, the ice and stim. Um, you'll even see it in some of the training rooms at the high schools where the kids will come in and they say they use the ice and stim. That is a muscle stimulation looking to contract uh, cause contraction and relaxation of, relaxation of muscles. Um, it's not used for pain management, but it's in a you know, PT setting um, to help with either a heat muscle healing or strengthening of a muscle. Um, so again, TENS devices are pain management devices. Safety, I think they're relatively safe. I mean, the risks are, are minimal as long as you're, again, you're following the manufacturer's instructions. Um, and uh, the electric impulses can be uncomfortable um, and you can't get skin allergies to adhesive pads. There, are theory, there was a reported uh, concern that if you put the electrodes in the neck, it can lower the blood, uh, lower your blood pressure. Um, again, I, I think that is um, not a very high risk issue. They are contraindicated if you're pregnant, you have epilepsy or you have a pacemaker. Uh, my thoughts, I think they're safe to use if somebody wants to try one at home, as long as they're not you know, putting it in an, in an odd location or for the wrong indication. Um, I, I don't think there's any problem for some short-term pain relief um, on that front. All right, let me just, before I go into laser. All right. Um, okay, next topic, laser. And again, as I was taking these topics on, each one was like a brand new learning experience for me. And um, you know, I probably bit off more than I can chew. This is a lot of information we're going to go through to, uh, over, you know, over the next half an hour now. Um, but I just thought it would be good to lay it out here. All of this information is going to be available to you after the fact. And so if I'm going too fast over certain things, just bear with me that you can always go back and look at it if there was a topic that interested you. So laser. Um, all right, laser. All right, low level laser therapy. So this is also referred to as cold laser, red light therapy, photobiomodulation. Um, the term applies to low power lasers or LED lights that are applied to the surface of the body. It's been used for years to treat sports injuries um, in a lot of uh, um, offices in the professional setting, um, but now it's readily available for uh, home use for people to purchase themselves. And that's the reason I, I bring it up here. Um, the mechanism is that, you know, high powered lasers are used to cut tissue, low power lasers stimulate enhanced cell function to help with healing. Um, this is a basic science lesson here. And basically the, the end result of laser is to uh, increase ATP. So that enhances the cell's ability to heal, um, to uh, modulate some of the reactive oxygen species, and then to release um, and to, to improve vas vasodilation. Um, so that's the theory behind it all. Uh, details. Okay, this is um, kind of way beyond my um, my my knowledge base. So I'm going to go basic here. So the wavelength of the laser, and uh, there's a there's a reason I'm going to go into this. But the wavelength determines how deep the um, light penetrates. 
Um, there are very strict um, criteria. This wavelength can penetrate skin. This is the best for most therapies. This is used for superficial. So it is a little complicated. Um, if you go too big of a wavelength, you lose all effectiveness. So there is a sweet spot in here. Um, power controls the dosage, it does not control how deep the wavelength goes. So too low of a dose, nothing happens. Too high, you might get a lot of pain relief, but it doesn't do much healing. Higher power does not make the energy any deeper. That's the wavelength, uh, it's just only faster. Um, so many smaller doses oftentimes produce the same results as a few big doses. So I go over this just to show that it is complicated and that's why considering using this at home is a little bit uh, troublesome at times. Um, so in 2005, this group, um, the World Association for Laser Therapy started uh, produce some evidence-based dosage recommendations because again, it's the wild world of laser out there. Um, a, nice, a, a, a nice review uh, in 17 showed that it is an effective treatment modality to reduce pain uh, with muscle skeletal disorders. Um, however, uh, adherence to these um, recommendations seem to, in, to enhance the treatment effectiveness. So doing more was not really helpful um, and that these recommendations were pretty spot on as to what was working. Um, there was a nice review in most, more recently that showed um, there is some bone healing effect that I think has the potential as we continue to research more about how these lasers work um, that may help uh, with some of the bone healing. Um, let's see, the dosing is complex. It depends on the type of tissue you're trying to, to affect and how deep you need to penetrate. Um, and there's really a lack of standardized guidelines. Um, the dosing parameters are all over the place. The control trials you know, do not produce data that's really good for comparison. And so everything was pretty inconclusive when I really dug into, you know, what works. I think there's promise um, just from what I've read, but I think we need to um, really standardize things a little bit more. So um, it's been used in uh, the FDA approved cold lasers can be sold for three indications, pain control, inflammation reduction, and increased blood flow. Those are the FDA approved reasons. There are different classes of lasers. Um, they are classified based on their risk for damage to the eyes. In California, you can um, lasers can be sold for home use with the recommendation of a healthcare provider. A lot of times the manufacturers have a doctor on staff who writes a letter so they stay in compliance. The vet and pet market is the fastest growing segment for this industry. Um, the FDA does not regulate lasers on animals. So therefore you can imagine that patients can buy vet lasers and use them on themselves. So you can buy any FDA cleared devices or any other low cost non FDA devices. So again, when somebody tells you they're using a laser, it's really important to figure out what exactly that they're using before you can say, yeah, that's a great idea. Or, hey, I don't know if that's a really great idea. Um, there's some really powerful new lasers um, out there um, with a lot of claims. Um, but again, uh, it's really about sticking to the ones that have been um, FDA approved. All right, LED, this is a new thing that you've seen all over Amazon. Um, they're, you know, they, they deliver a portion of the, of the true energy into the tissue compared to the lasers. It's usually used very superficially. Um, they might have the correct wavelength, but they don't have the energy to get it into the tissues. Uh, it was about five, so this is really, um, are not probably not having a very big effect. Um, some devices out there are a combination of LED and laser, which again, has not been studied uh, as a combination, but has the potential to um, be effective. So safety, they're well tolerated, very few side effects. Um, oh, I cut off part of the sign here. Um, you, you probably should wear eye protection if you're using it near your eyes. They're contraindicated um, if you have an embedded electronic. Um, it's photosensitive or like patients. If you visually look at them, they could potentially trigger a seizure. Developing bones, and this is what's relevant to us in the pediatric world. Um, there were studies on rats, yuck, um, that showed uh, if you used this higher wavelength daily for 21 days, that there was no, that it did have a negative effect on the physis. So there is a theoretical effect if you used a ton of laser along the growing bone, it could affect the, the development of the physis. Um, so there may be some clinical benefit. It is an alternative to the analgesics. Um, it's safe, I think, for most injuries, as long as you're using a, a reputable device. 
Um, I would just recommend that we stay away from on a daily use of the physis and the apophysis. So I would not use it um, on, you know, a chronic iliac crest apophysitis on a daily basis. So I think that's a good idea. All right, let me just, simple question. Do I believe these devices actually work? You know, I, um, I think there potentially could be some benefit for these devices. I don't think the LED wraps you get, uh, I don't think there's any evidence on that front. Um, but I do think that the, um, especially for some of the you know, fracture healing things, uh, wound healing, deep tissue injuries, I, th I think there is potential. Um, I think we've got to really better refine what work, what wavelengths, what powers, the treatment protocols, et cetera. All right, as you can see, I'm switching to ice. And I can tell you right now, I'm gonna be a little short on time. So I might skip through a couple of slides um, just in the interest of making sure I get to the end. Um, all right, so ice, cryotherapy is any modality which cools the body for therapeutic purposes. So it's an ice pack, cold water immersion, whole body cryotherapy. So the history of rice. So historically, it's the first line of treatment for medical injuries. The ancient Egyptians used cold to improve health and reduce inflammation. The Greeks and Romans were there too. Um, in 1978, Gabe Merkin in his sports medicine book coined the term rice. The second component is the ice, uh, which is what we're gonna talk about now. It was intended to quickly and effectively minimize pain, restore mobility and return athletes to the field. That was what the ice was, the rice was designed for. Fast forward 2014, Dr. Merkin updated his findings and concluded that rice actually may delay the body's natural healing process. So if you continue to use rice for two, three, four days, that maybe that's not the best idea. He cited several studies showing that there's little evidence that ice promotes recovery. Again, this is recovery, not pain control. Um, and that cooling of damaged tissues and complete rest inhibits blood flow and inflammation from the area and inflate and hypothesize that if you inhibit inflammation, you're gonna slow down healing and prolong recovery. Like the inflammation is good because that's your body's natural way to heal. Um, so the inflammation is a nat natural and healthy response, but prolonged inflammation can do more harm than good. So from there came this, which I'm not gonna go into detail, but a zillion other substitutes for rice, many of them avoiding ice. All right, I'm gonna actually fly through this one. This is probably, this is more about how injuries heal. Um, there's really three phases. Phase one is inflammation, phase two is remodel, and phase three is regeneration. Um, and what is the role of ice? You know, I think ice works as a pain reliever. So it reduces the sensory transmission in the inflammatory phase. Um, it can decrease, it causes vasoconstriction and decreases the metabolic rate of injured tissue. So it can prevent secondary ischemic injury and, um, and inflammation. So the whether or not the benefit of avoiding secondary ischemic injury outweighs the benefit of decreasing inflammation or of, of limiting inflammation is, is still yet to be seen. So have we gotten away from ice? And that's the question, I get that all the time. Should we ice it or should we heat it? I've heard ice is bad. Someone told, told me no, never to put ice on an injury. There's no clear consensus about the use of ice. Ice in 20, 15 to 20 minutes does improve pain because it reduces edema and inflammation. Um, reducing pain theoretically could help decrease the overall recovery speed, but there's no evidence proof. So I am a still a proponent of ice in the first 24 to 48 hours after injury. Um, for this reason alone, just to decrease the edema. Because once you get a lot of edema in an injury, a lot of times it's very hard to then get it to uh, go away and that delays your recovery. Um, there's more evidence about the benefit for ice for recovery and delayed onset muscle soreness. That's probably where most of the research has been done. Um, I'm gonna get into that in a second. Um, and again, most of the, uh, the recommendations about ice are based on anecdotal evidence and theory, not scientific studies. Um, I just said that. All right, so ice baths, um, active ingredients, simple ice and water. It's the, typically it is used to reduce post-exercise muscle stiffness and soreness, to eliminate fatigue and to dec decrease that DOMS, the exercise uh, 
induce muscle damage um, and improve recovery. Um, the body temperature and blood, the reduced body temperature reduces blood flow. It decreases your inflammatory response. The endorphin rush um, can help reduce fatigue and the decrease in surface temperature potentially could minimize hypoxic cell death. The evidence, um, cold water immersion can help your performance for up to 24 hours, but not beyond. So for example, if you had a football game on a Friday night, and you needed to be able to play in a soccer game on a Saturday, because kids do that. Um, getting in an ice bath on Friday night would help you on Saturday. If you had a football game on Friday night and we're gonna rest all weekend and not go back to practice till Monday, there's probably no benefit whether you jump in an ice bath other than you might feel better. Um, but by Monday, your recovery will be the same. And then another similar um, Study show the same thing. It's most effective for the first 24 hours, but if you actually look at people several days later, their recovery is the same. Um, lots of studies have bias. Uh, again, lots of stuff about using it for delayed onset muscle soreness. It's no more effective than other forms of active recovery. So again, if you don't have access to an ice bath and you go home and you do some stretching and you do uh, the, you know, some gentle range of motion, that probably is just as effective as an ice bath. They're, it's very commercially available. So the main dangers we worry about are drowning, hypothermia, and cardiac arrest. Contraindicated for, for this, these individuals, um, somebody who has a propensity to have cold uh, urticaria or renounce, uh, I'd be careful with, somebody with an underlying heart arrhythmia. My thoughts, um, I think the evidence supporting cold water immersion is probably the strongest of any of them, um, especially in somebody who has a multiple game weekend or needs to feel better within a day or two. Um, I think there's value. Usually I recommend 10 minutes um, is, the, is the best duration. Um, and again, it's useful if it's consecutive days. All right, real quick. Can you share my PowerPoint? How cold does it need to be to help? That's the 50 to 60 degrees. And we'll talk about that again. I'm going to get there with the next slide too. So whole body cryotherapy, again, this is a hot topic um, that I don't know if I have great answers on. Um, so basically it's these, it's these facilities that you go into and they expose your body to really, really cold temperatures for two to four minutes. Um, the proposed mechanism is all of the proposed musculoskeletal benefits. So again, there's a lot of other proposed benefits I'm not going to talk about. But the thought is that it lowers the inflammatory substances within the blood and body, decreasing swelling and inflammation. It slows nerve conduction to help with pain. Um, and then when you get out and you warm, it increases blood flow and can help with healing. Um, so when they advertise it to athletes, it's pain relief, you're gonna heal faster, speed your recovery and have less, less delayed onset soreness. It is a celebrity, uh, it is, we call it celebrity cryotherapy. Um, you can see LeBron and, and Will Smith here um, advertising for a lot of these companies. Um, the evidence is that it can lower your skin and muscle temperature um, to a similar degree as icing. Um, it can reduce the soreness in the short term and accelerate the perception of recovery, but it did not lead to improved function or performance after the fact. Um, and this was an interesting one that was twice in two different studies. It doesn't alter the amount of um, uh, muscle damage as reflected by, you know, blood tests. They did some work looking at, you know, muscle breakdown, um, and it did not change those. Um, there continues people continue to report subjective improvement in pain, soreness, and recovery compared to other re recovery strategies. So subjectively, patients like it. They, they report it makes them feel better, um, but we don't have the scientific evidence to prove it. Why? Well, the ultra cold temperatures do have quite an endocrine response and release adrenaline, noradrenaline, and endorphins. And in fact, some of the better studies on these tanks are um, related to um, uh, using it for uh, anxiety, depression, uh, fibromyalgia, things of that nature. All right, potential risks are frostbite, cold urticaria, bradycardia, nerve injury, um, Risks can be minimized by safety protocols. The, it's similar contraindications to an ice bath. My thoughts, you know, 
it's readily available. It is pretty expensive and I'm not sure it gives any other benefit other than an ice bath. And so I'd probably go that route, but I, if somebody wants to do it, I tell them it's fine if they want to pay for it. We need some better designed um, studies on it. All right, I'm gonna get, jump into creams and ointments. Um, so topical treatments, uh, it's a very practical alternative to oral drug delivery. It avoids first pass metabolism, lower systemic events, um, direct application over target areas. Topically delivered agents, they, they can accumulate in therapeutic concentrations. I'm gonna skip all that. Um, the perme perme ugh, permeation of the drug across the skin is the, probably the biggest challenge. Um, and the delivery vehicle, whether it's an ointment, a gel, a cream, a lotion, a spray, or a patch, um, really affects how it's absorbed. So the active ingredients, there's a ton of them. The, uh, the estimated value of the topical pain relief market in the U.S. is at 11 million, and it's expected to only increase. Um, many of them are marketed towards sports injuries um, and pain relief. Um, there's not a lot of, again, not a lot of reliable data. Many of them function as what we call a counter irritant, which causes irritation and inflammation of the skin. Um, by, and it relieves pain by overloading uh, the uh, sensory receptors in the nerve endings. So we will hear that in a second. These are the ingredients. I have slides on each of these. Again, I don't have enough time, I don't think, to go through each of the slides. So I am going to skip a few um, just so I'm not talking a mile a minute. I'm already talking about a minute, but any more. Um, Arnica, capsaicin, camphor, uh, turmeric, Epsom salts, menthol, methyl salicylate, and NSAIDs. And I'm really gonna, I'm gonna breeze through those first eight and really focus on the last two because I think there's some important information to tell you on those ones. Um, most of our data is on topical NSAIDs, which actually I think is somewhat encouraging. So Arnica, I'm gonna just skip through that. Thoughts, well-tolerated, unclear benefit when used alone. It's commonly used in combination products like this one, Penetrex, which is the sponsor of the National Pickleball Association and John McEnroe. Um, so again, well-tolerated, safe, eh, um, not great studies showing that it helps, don't ingest it. Um, and again, in a lot of the topical products, you'll find it in it as a combination. Camphor, um, again, this is what we typically see in Biofreeze, Bengay, Tiger Balm. Um, it's very unsafe if you eat it. It creates a warm and cold sensation. Um, this is, the, you know, you don't want to be above 11%, otherwise it becomes toxic. Um, it is effective at relieving pain uh, in short term. And it, again, that is all by, as a counter irritant, meaning that it, um, its actions on nerve endings cause analgesia. analgesia. All right, capsaicin, um, hot pepper, burns, counter irritant. Um, wear gloves, avoid eyes. It's not my first choice. I don't find that patients ask very often about this one. This is found in capsaicin, salon pos, hot. Um, again, an asper cream. This is not one that patients come in frequently. Um, so um, I, I don't, it's not one of the ones I, I typically would recommend. Um, topical. Um, so I'm gonna skip this one real quick. This one we're gonna go past. Epsom salts, Epsom salt baths people do all the time. Um, it's magnesium sulfate. The thought is that if you soak in a bath of magnesium sulfate, your body will absorb the magnesium, um, which will help with muscle soreness, swelling and inflammation. Evidence is that it, the magnesium does not get absorbed through the skin, but a bath is relaxing. So yes, it's safe. Check the water temperature. Don't do it if you have open wounds. Um, it's relaxing. Soaking blisters in Epsom salt actually can be um, helpful because it affects the endothelial layer of the skin. And that's actually one of the areas that I find it, uh, does have some benefit. All right, menthol, zoom, zoom. Uh, again, it's also in biofreeze along and it's frequently used in combination with camphor. Um, it's a counter irritant. Um, and uh, again, it's in biofreeze and icy hot. This is the one I want to talk about, methyl salicylate. This is a wintergreen. It works by several different um, factors. It does have uh, a topical analgesic. There is some inflammatory benefit. It's a counter irritant. And then it also makes, it's a vasodilator. So it makes things, uh, desensitizes and then it makes things warm. You probably can imagine what products this is in. 
um, Ben Gay, Biofreeze Professional, so the, the, more, the stronger Biofreeze, and Icy Hot. Um, the reason I wanted to, to, to spend one minute on this slide is um, everybody uses it. It's super, super common. Um, the safety data is limited. Uh, an eight hour um, application of a patch did provide good pain control. So I think there is um, compared, compared to a patch that was just uh, a placebo. So I do think there's some benefit to it. There are case reports of toxicity. There was a 17 year old cross country runner from Staten Island who um, passed away and they found toxic levels of methyl salicylate in her body and felt that it was from um, inappropriate use of Bengay and Icy Hot that had been absorbed into her system. So I, I think this is a very, very unusual case and it must have been a lot being used, um, but I think on the whole, Bengay, Biofreeze, Icy Hot, they're all good for pain relief um, and I think they're safe. Uh, Methyl salicylate, just so you, as a fun fact, is the ingredient that is in the Lifesaver Wintergreens that give them that bio, uh, that give them that color when you uh, crack them in the dark. All right, lastly, topical NSAIDs, there's a zillion of them, 10 dosage forms, more than 10 ingredients. Um, topical application is two to six times out of oral administration. Um, they are a lot of really good studies that you're more than four times likely to reduce acute pain by 50% or more compared to placebo. It's more effective. The most effective were diclofenac gel, which is Voltaren gel um, on the um, uh, commercial side. Um, and there is better compliance with topical as compared to oral. As compared to oral. So there are local skin reactions, but the systemic adverse events are low. It's contraindicated for mucous membranes and your eyes. Um, patient, patients who are allergic to oral ibuprofen uh, or NSAIDs are discouraged from using it um, just because the theoretical uh, absorption into the system could potentially trigger an allergic reaction. Um, topical NSAIDs, especially diclofenac, has been, have been used way more commonly in Europe and Asia than in the US. Um, the penetration varies from person to person and product to product. So it really is hard sometimes to figure out um, how effective the different um, options are. And there's not a lot of data on pediatric patients, um, less than 12. So Voltaren gel is the one that we probably hear most about. Um, I'm gonna, this says very similar to what I just said. Um, what's interesting is that in 2020 in the US, the 1% strength became available uh, over the counter. So it was Voltaren gel initially. Now there's uh, a lot of other generic brands. Costco has their version, et cetera. Um, there's very strict, you know, there's very detailed instructions on how to apply them. In other countries, there is a patch and a, a plaster and a 2% gel. So patients can, if they're traveling, get this from in other countries. This is over the counter in other countries. Um, and there's a good study out of China um, using the 2% uh, twice a day for an ankle sprain, and there was a clinically significant improvement in healing um, or de in re recovery. So I do think there is potential moving forward for more uh, studies on the stronger versions of the uh, products. Most of the products your patients come into, come in with, are combos. So they're not going to just be one or the other. They're not going to come in and say, I'm taking this or that. So like Icy Hot is methyl salicylate menthol. Tiger Bomb is a little bit of everything with some capsaicin. Bengay has multiple versions, one with methyl salicylate, one without. And so it's really important to look at the ingredients of what they're putting on themselves. If they just say Bengay, it could be, a, it could be anything. The final thoughts, I like the topical application of things because it avoids the GI system. There's not a lot of systemic uh, side effects. It's, you can stop it if it's, there's any side effects. Um, it's direct access and there's better compliance than taking a pill. Um, the cons, you know, it has to diffuse across. There's a lot of variability on skin permeability and local skin irritation can be common and people can go overboard. Like this stuff is not encouraged. Putting Bengay and then wrapping it on a uh, plastic wrap around, things like that. People do go overboard and this is, you know, this is a challenge and obviously contraindicated. All right, and then again, just as my last, I'm gonna use this as my last slide. Um, 
So for pain control in the acute setting, things that are potentially useful, ice, topical creams, gels, and patches, laser, and KT tape. For chronic pain control, again, the topical stuff, a TENS unit, laser, KT tape, and for recovery, ice bath, massage guns, and laser. Again, evidence on all of this is anecdotal. Most of it is anecdotal. I think laser and diclofenac gel probably have the most promise of everything I've looked at, uh, that I reviewed, short of the Theragun having um, the Theragun having some potential benefit with um, range of motion in some of our really tight growing teens. Um, I'm going to stop there. My email is down here at the bottom. Please feel free to reach out if you have any questions. I can't guarantee I have answers, but I'll give you my best. I'm going to look in the Q&A now. Um, yes, that one's done. Any studies on patients who typically are advised against ibuprofen use? Yes. So there's no studies on them but theoretically there is concern and so they are contraindicated. Um, topical lidocaine, that was one of the ones I didn't, uh, I didn't, um, I did not tackle that one. Um, yes, there, the topical lidocaine has a lot, has more potential for skin reactions than some of the other topical patches. Um, for, and it, it does, it can provide um, short-term relief. Please, oh, okay, hold on a sec. I'm asked, I gotta fix my slide. So as you, as I, as I promised, there's a zillion things here that I went through. Um, this slide right here, I think is what you wanted. There. Okay, well, um, let's see, I'm tackling questions. For elderly patients, you know, I, um, <laughs> So I went in, yeah, I'm not, so I went into pedi pediatrics because most of these kids don't have other you know, pre-existing conditions. There were a lot of concerns about um, individuals who have cardiac history, who have underlying um, other medical conditions. And so most of what I've talked about today does not apply to elderly individuals. Oops, I didn't. All right, well, hold on a second. This isn't the slide you want. There we go. Um, okay. Okay, elderly patients, what, I'm sorry, I'm trying to click on my questions. Here we go. What is the lightest weight massage gun that is most effective? Any of the smaller travel ones recommended? Again, it has less to do with how much the massage gun weighs and more about the percussion that the gun provides. And again, there are no studies showing what is the optimal um, kinetics behind it. You also can affect it by how hard you press the massage gun against your skin. Contrast pads, um, hot, cold, like hot tub, ice, hot tub, alternating. Um, I typically, again, that was one thing I skipped because as you can see, there's too much content in this talk. Um, it can help with swelling reduction. So if you have a big swollen ankle, um, that can help uh, the vaso vasodilation and the contraction. Um, but I don't use it typically in the acute injury setting. I use it more if there is pre-existing swelling um, in somebody. Will you have access to these slides? I hope so. I know this is recorded live. So if nothing else, you can just go through and pause and get the information. I know it's a lot of information and it just kept growing the more I was going. So, um, you know, I, I was a little hesitant to take on a new challenge. Um, so I hope this goes okay for you guys um, and it's not too much and I didn't talk too fast. Um, but I think the more information we can get out there, the, the easier it is for us to give good advice. Is Voltaren okay to use on joint pain or back pain? I, theoretically, yes. I think that there is, um, you can use it in, in that, that air, large of an area. I would not do a whole body application, but yes, I think that is a, an appropriate application for a Voltaren gel. Um, Thought on moist heat. Uh, did not look into it. Um, typically for muscle spasm, I like moist heat. I find that it does, um, it has been anecdotally shown to, to help uh, with muscle spasm, but that was not one of the things I, I dug into. Uh, 